Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 42 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and with me once again is Pervez Ahmed. Yes, welcome everyone. Welcome back, and uh, good to have you back. Um, and so, yeah, we had a great conversation last time with uh, Shadi, uh, Shadi Hamid, and uh, sort of continuing our connections to Georgetown University. Uh, super excited with the guests that we have today. I've been uh, we're wanting to have uh, our guest on for quite some time, so I'm very excited about this. Well, and and uh, we're, we're joined this week by Jonathan Brown, who is the Al-Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and he's the director of the Al-Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He received his BA in History from Georgetown in 2000, and his doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago in 2006. Dr. Brown has studied and conducted research in countries such as Egypt, Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, South South Africa, India, Indonesia, and Iran. His book publications include The Canonization of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, The Formalization and Function of the Sunni Hadith Canon, Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval and Modern World, and Muhammad, A Very Short Introduction, which was selected for the National Endowment for the Humanities Bridging Cultures Muslim Journeys bookshelf. In his most recent book, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy, was named one of the top books on religion of 2014 by The Independent. He's published articles in the fields of Hadith, Islamic law, Salafism, Sufism, Arabic lexical theory, and pre-Islamic poetry, and is the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and Law. Dr. Brown's current research interests include Islamic legal reform and a translation of Sahih al-Bukhari. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for coming on Diffuse Congruence with us. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I should point out to our listeners, you know, in, in addition to sort of the connection to Georgetown, um, you know, I was remiss to not mention uh, you are joined also on this show by uh, alums from University of Chicago, uh, namely uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah and Dr. Ingrid Matson. So mm. I forgot to make that connection. Um, and like Shadi, who was our last guest, uh, you and I first met um, – uh, back in Egypt, and uh, it was circa 2006, I believe. Um, I don't know. We spent some time in Cairo. I don't know if you remember those days. Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And it was it was great. It was great yeah. meeting you. Uh, I think at that time, and we'll, and we'll get into this, but I think that was sort of your second long stint in, in Cairo, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was a great time for me. I learned a lot, and it was a very formative period for my education. Wonderful. Um, and we'd love to get into that, certainly. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we'd love to sort of maybe start off uh, uh, before that time. I mean, certainly uh, we'd love to hear about sort of your, uh, as I often ask, your origin story, um, how it all sort of began and where you grew up and uh, uh, and uh, perhaps also kind of talking about how your journey to Islam. Uh, boy, you guys... So uh, you really want to hear about that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just uh, I hesitate only because you know I think I wrote something about that years and years. It's probably the first thing I ever wrote back when I don't even think you know I think like the internet was still relatively new. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, but there's it's probably somewhere on the online uh, called uh, I did not choose the title. Just to be clear, uh, I don't like the title. It's obnoxious, but. It's called like, from from wasp to Muslim, like from white Anglo-Saxon Protestant to Muslim. So if you Google Jonathan Brown and then that, you'll probably find that. And it's a much much better version than I could uh, than I could give. But I'll just if you since you really want to know, <laughs> well, I mean, I'll you tell you. I mean, then yeah, you can start off. I mean, I'll, well, well, okay. Well, I mean, I was I'm actually from Washington D.C. originally. Well, I shouldn't say that. I'm from the suburbs of Washington D.C. I'm from a suburb called Chevy Chase, which of is. Course. Um, yeah, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty much a really wealthy white suburb of a city that's really horribly racially divided. So, um, I mean, I had pretty much zero interaction with anybody who was not wealthy white person or sort of international global elite. You know, kids who went to the whose parents worked at the World Bank and happened to be from Turkey, but you know. Were culturally no different from me as far as I could tell. Anyway, so that's where I grew up, and I I I don't mean to criticize my upbringing. I mean I had a very great childhood, and my parents were wonderful parents, so I have no complaints. I was very privileged, thank God. I had no problems. 
Right, and, right. And uh, I uh, went to uh, college at Georgetown. Well, actually, I went to high school in California. I should mention that first. My dad, my dad wanted me to go to boarding school to build character because he also went to boarding school. <laughs> right. And so he liked this boarding school in California a lot called Thatcher, which is a great school. I mean, I really liked it. But uh, he sent me there. I didn't want to go, but he sent me. And I enjoyed it a lot. And actually, Weird Connection, that's, it's in this small town in California called Ojai, O-J-A-I. Yeah. And it's also where Hamza Yusuf went to high school. He didn't go to high school at Thatcher. He went to high school called a school called Ojai Valley School, which is a, the lesser high school in that, the lesser boarding school in that town. So that's a weird, I mean, nobody else knows where Ojai is except me and Hamza Yusuf, as far as I can tell. And uh, <laughs> it's really, also, it's in, it's in the Steven Seagal movie, Hard to Kill, oh. uh, if you've ever seen the movie. <laughs> yeah. he, ret he retreats there after he comes out of his coma, when he's being nursed by uh, Kelly LeBrock. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so Ojai you know, is where, like you, where you convalesce, yeah. basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you care about, uh, you know, what's a good movie? Um, so then anyway, what happened? Oh yeah. I went to, then I went to a high school at Georgetown. Uh, oh, and yeah. yeah, sorry. College. I'm in college. And then, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say. It was so long ago. I, it's hard for me to remember. No, and no. I, 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 I became, I was, uh, uh, you know, my family was, uh, Episcopalian Christians, but my dad was the only one who was particularly practicing. And I don't, he died recently. God rest his soul. I, I actually don't, to this day, I don't really understand what his religious identification, I mean, in the sense, I don't really understand what his religion meant to him, except that somehow it meant something. Hmm. I'm not really sure what it meant. But uh, we went to church every Sunday, and I was acolyte. You know, I carried the cross and stuff, and I helped the, the uh, minister, you know, prepare the communion and of course, we got communion first, which is great because I love the wine. I was definitely going to be some kind of alcoholic, that's for sure. <laughs> I really liked alcohol a lot. Um, anyway, so that was, uh, whatchamacallit? Oh, yeah. So then I, I but then by the time I, I got into college, I was really, I had a lot, a lot, a lot of existential angst. I had major, almost debilitating existential angst in high school. I just couldn't deal with my own mortality. I mean, to put it lightly, I, mean, I don't want to sound dramatic or anything. Like I said, I didn't have any real problems. So it's not mm -hmm. like I was, you know, a Syrian refugee or something like that. I mean, I had... Um, but anyway, by the time I got into... Uh, to, to start a university, my brain was really uh, revving. It's just revving hard. I remember this the whole summer, again, just to show you how easy my life was, I... Um, you know, the summer before, between high school and college, I don't think I did anything. I'm not sure I did a single productive thing that summer, which is really weird. I mean, I don't know anybody who would be that lazy nowadays. <laughs> anyway, so I, I I, basically just, I read the whole summer. And I remember I read, one of the things I read is I read the whole, all the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. And uh, I really, uh, my, it just, they just got, I just remember they got my brain revving really hard. I could just my when I started university, I was just so eager to learn. I know it sounds cheesy. Hmm. I was so eager to learn. I was so eager to think, and uh, so I started taking we at Georgetown, which is a it's a Jesuit school. So you have to take two religion classes over your course of your four years. So the first one I took was Intro to Biblical Literature, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, but I, I had never really been committed Christian. Uh, I don't think I really understood the religion very well, uh, which is probably the fault of my Sunday school teachers. So then I don't, I, I just, uh, but then a second class I took was uh, Intro to Islamic Thought and Practice, my second semester of my freshman year. And that class really uh, obviously captivated me. And I, I just got so interested in Islam and learning everything I could about it. And then, I don't know, I guess by the end of that summer after my freshman year, I really had, I decided to become Muslim, I guess. I mean, I don't mm. go back and, I don't know, there's probably a lot of drama in there and everything, but that's the long story. And uh, so I made that choice, and it was an interesting choice, an interesting choice to make because I think it, you know, I'm very grateful that I, I was afforded this chance at that time in my life because 
I, I made the choice without any consideration of consequence at all. And I, I think there's very few moments in one's life when one can make a choice without thinking about the consequences. And that was one of them for me. But I mean, so I think, you know, if I were a now, if I were now in that position, I mean, I'd have probably a non-Muslim wife and non-Muslim kids and non-Muslim friends and all this stuff. And then I would choose to do that. And I'm not sure how much of that would stick with me. Uh, but I mean, I'm actually, I'm, I'm very, as the years gone by, I've, I've become more and more appreciative of my friends who almost none of whom stopped being friends with me because I became Muslim. And, and I think they actually put up with a lot of probably stuff they consider to be really weird. Uh, and I, I think I, it makes me, I've, I've gotten, I should probably go and try and thank these guys, but, uh, I've come, become more and more appreciative of, of the of the way they. Uh, I'm, I don't, I actually don't I don't know if I would have been able to put up with that. Anyway, hmm. um, ha- how about how about the response at home? I mean, like, what was? Oh, your my family was very happy. I think. Well, they were. Uh, you know, my dad, God rest his soul, he always used to say that becoming Muslim was the best thing that I ever did because I, I think I was really mm-hmm. not. I was really not in good shape before that. I mean, I, I don't want to, again, I wasn't a Syrian refugee and I wasn't, you know, a, a, a serial drug user or, you know, in and out of prison or something. I mean, I think I just was, I just had a lot of emotion, a lot of anxiety, and uh, I, I didn't really, I really wasn't functioning very well in my life, I'd say. I mean, I still excelled in, in my studies, but I, I was just uh, very unhappy person i think and uh and so when i became muslim a lot of that went away um and uh, my parents were very happy about that i became a much better i became a much better son i became a much better brother anyway so that's what happened and 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 like in terms of your interactions your early interactions with the muslim community uh in, in 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 dc um how was that Ah, uh, this was, I was so blessed, thank God. I mean, this was really, yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, when I became Muslim, I met through, so there's a guy, I don't know if you've ever come across him, his name's Carl Altubge, he teaches at Brandeis now. I think he's, his name's Carl Sharif Altubge, he's actually half Egyptian, half French Canadian or something like that, but he, uh, he, he also kind of became Muslim, and, and he had been, gone through that process a couple of years before me. And he really like, took me under his wing and a bunch of other, and sort of through him, I met all these other people in the D.C. area. Mm-hmm. Um, people like, uh, I'm just naming it, Mona Diab and Hal Del Gindi and this guy Mike Sanford and uh, what's his name? Um, oh, my God, Sven White. And this, uh, so many other people, really this group of, some, some of them were converts, some of them were from, a lot of people were from other countries studying here. Right. And I remember my first Ramadan, and that was when Ramadan was right at the same time as Christmas vacation. So it was a party. I had so much fun. I mean, I learned so much. Every day, every iftar with these people, it was just like an intensive uh, discussion session about Islam and issues relating to it. And I learned so much, and they, 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 they were so welcoming and, and good to me that I... That was my first experience with the Muslim community, and it was it was just incredibly positive. Incredibly and I'm, positive. I'm very grateful for for that, and I'm very thankful to those people for taking me in as they did. Yeah, because I mean, we, we we've had our share of you know people who've shared their stories with us, um, you know, in terms of coming into the faith, and you know, unfortunately, in some cases, their earliest interactions with the Muslim community aren't so positive. So. Um, it's actually good to. It's actually refreshing to hear that. So, oh, Muslims are nice people. I mean, come on, people are so <laughs> harsh. People, Muslims are so hard on each other. I mean, right, uh, right, no doubt. Uh, anyway, I mean, uh, there's a lot of nasty people in the world, and I haven't come across very many of them in the Muslims that I've met in my life. Huh. I'll just say that much. Good, good. So, good. Um, so, so what, what, I'm just curious. When you were at Georgetown, was uh, Professor uh, Esposito there at the time? He, he was actually, but I never took classes with him. Interesting. I took classes with uh, Doctor Vol, John Vol, yeah, who then became my colleague. 
Uh, I took classes with Yvonne Haddad, who is currently my colleague. I took classes with a lot of other people who are currently my colleagues. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Spazio, I never took class with because he only taught one class, really, which was for people in the School of Foreign Service. And I was in the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, so actually, I was always scared of him and intimidated by him. And I never actually met him until after I graduated. Uh, and I remember he called me to his office. He wanted to meet me. And I had probably just started grad school. And I was incredibly uh, honored. And I think, you know, he's a very generous person. And he's very, uh, unlike a lot of people who sort of will all mentor somebody until they use them and then kick them out, you know, or just kick them to the curb. He really takes people and, and mentors them and, and tries to help them and promote their, their interests um, consistently and regardless of whatever benefit accrues to him. And, and he did that with me. I mean, he really kind of took me under his wing from an early age. And um, I mean, and from a distance, I mean, he would just sort of at crucial moments, he would write a letter of recommendation or he would, you know, be there to give me advice. And um, and eventually that ended up with uh, me coming to Georgetown to teach in 2010. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely want to talk about that. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned uh, his name, uh, obviously. And, and I mean, just, I mean, anyone who's sort of not only if you're whether you're in Islamic studies or not, but I mean, John Esposito, whether it's through his media appearances or whatever, um, you know, he's just a giant in the field and people know him. And um, and the stories that you're sharing in terms of him being so gracious, uh, I know a lot of undergrads who actually did take classes with him and just share the same kind of sentiment. Um, uh, but anyway, and, and obviously now you're the head, uh, you're, you are at the center of... Yeah, I'm uh, his boss. I'm that's his right. Boss now. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's just fascinating. I call uh, him into my office and I make him like polish <laughs> my shoes and things like that. No, I'm just, I don't do that, obviously. But anyway. Right. Well, you go on to sort of, yeah, uh, you're, his, you're the successor to, 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 to him uh, in terms of the position now, right? Uh, mm -hmm. at, at the center uh, for uh, a Christian Muslim understanding. But... Um, yeah, I mean, and, and then, so now you find yourself at the University of Chicago. Uh, now, um, at, at that time, you were probably there with, uh, uh, I'm forgetting her name. Professor uh, Cotty, with Dr. Cotty, Cotty, my Cotty, advisor. Yeah, of course. She was your advisor. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Omer was a, was a legend and a thing of the past by the time you got there? Yeah, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, he had left years before, but you know, people still talked about him and his dissertation was, you know, um, even though it was never, it, it's recently been published. In fact, I have it on my shelf here. I have to write a review of the book and haven't gotten around to finishing it. But uh, his dissertation, which had never been published, you know, people would, would read his dissertation. Yeah. And uh, he, and actually I ran into him one day when I was, I mean, I, eventually I would, see him with some regularity i mean it wasn't just one time that i met him but you know i ran into him one day in the library and i basically i, I don't know what I, I don't know if i asked him a question or if he just told me something but i he basically told me okay if you really want to understand islamic law you have to go read xyz book he told me about the books of uh sheikh muhammad abu zahra who's an egyptian scholar who died i think around 1974 yeah and uh he um and that really, I started reading those, and that was kind of the beginning of, I think, whatever, to whatever extent I've understood these things properly, it was through that beginning you know, down that path. So uh, he really was there again at a crucial moment in my life to help me. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, when I was in Cairo, I think, it, I, don't know, I don't know if it was you or if it was Professor Jackson, but um, you know, one of you or both of you recommended uh, 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 Dr. Abu Zahra's works and the, mm -hmm. the, the, I think I have about three or four on my bookshelf and those are I think by way of the fact that I picked them up on a recommendation and uh, uh, yeah great great uh, great great introductions and books to, 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 to definitely look at um, so yeah because Dr. Omar is back uh, stateside then in 2000 you're still in the pro probably in the process of finishing up your dissertation and your PhD at University of Chicago when he comes back Right. Well, I started in two. I started grad okay. school four days after nine eleven. I started oh, wow. September fifteenth. Oh, wow. I drove to Chicago September fifteenth, two thousand one. I remember, uh, and then I uh, that's so I finished in two thousand six. So between two thousand one two thousand six, I was 
uh, you know, especially the first four years I lived in Chicago. So rumor has it that you finished your PhD in record time at the University of Chicago. Is that true? Like, were you the quickest guy? Yeah, in I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not. That's I'm, a rumor. Is, I heard. I'm not. Time. This isn't like I don't think this is a mark of anything. But yes, I, I think that I set a record. Or yeah, I think I, it was five years. I think either either I set the record or I tied the record. I don't. I don't know what it is. But it's unusual. Right. The University of Chicago. The average is you know seven probably seven. years. Yep. Uh, six six is pretty quick. Five is very quick. But you know there's uh, there's benefits and drawbacks to doing that. You know I, I think as years. As time's gone by, I, I sometimes regret uh, not spending more time doing things that I could have done in grad school that I couldn't do afterwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so is that where your focus on Hadith and Hadith studies sort of really emerges uh, as a graduate student? Yeah, because I was, um, you know, I was always interested in Hadith uh, from when I first became Muslim. I became Muslim really through reading books like, uh, you know, The Message of the Quran, Muhammad Asad, uh, the, the Road to Mecca, Muhammad Asad, and the books of Fazl Rahman. And there's not a lot of Hadiths in those books. Like this. So uh, right. I, I remember when I first became Muslim, and I, I, I think I remember I was at this like, barbecue at Georgetown, and there was this Lebanese guy, or B.I. is his name. He's a very nice guy. And uh, it was the first time I heard about like Bukhari and Muslim. You know, and someone told me a hadith, and they said I had to, I had to do something because of this hadith, and then the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. And I said, "What the heck is all this stuff?" I mean, what I never heard of this. And I from I think from that moment on, I I wanted to you know, and then of course, as you know, so many of the controversial issues Muslims talk about and deal with and are confronted with are um, you know are in the hadith; they're not in the Quran. So I think. Uh, that was always something I had in my mind, but when I applied to do grad school, I was apply. I applied to study Islamic philosophy. Okay. And uh, when I got there, there was nobody doing Islamic philosophy. I'm not sure why they let me in, but the <laughs> they uh, Professor Cadi, I think, must have liked me or something. She must have seen some potential. So then I uh, when I got there, there was actually a guy who was studying Hadith. His name is Scott Lucas. He's actually Muslim as well. In yeah. fact, he and I are weird have a weird life parallel because his his mother and my mother were friends growing up and Fascinating. we had we had no idea about that until i came home my first year from grad school and there was this christmas card on the table you know with a picture of a family and i said why is scott lucas in this picture <laughs> my mom said that's that's my friend ellen lucas's son and i said well so anyway to both of their kids became muslim both of them graduated from university of chicago yeah, both of them, and then both of them married Palestinian women. Uh, yeah. So odd parallels. That's and Scott's true. brother, by the way, uh, wrote the Hangover screenplay. So there you go. Um, wow! Wow! Uh, yeah. yeah, my reaction as well. Uh, is 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 uh, uh, Scott at, at, in, at still still at Arizona? This yeah, is, uh, John Arizona. Lucas. Yeah, John Jonathan Lucas. Yeah. Wow, that that is fascinating. I, I mean, I, it's funny because yeah, both of you got both your your name and Scott Lewis Lucas's name sort of come on my like, at least uh, as far as just my radar at the, around the same time. And both of you guys, I think, were finishing up or had just graduated. Well, he years. finishes before me, but he okay. he he uh, he got he got married. Well, yeah, he got married when he was still a PhD student. So this is the this is the difference between Scott and me. I got married when I was thirty two. He got married when I don't know when he, how old he was. But the point is, I had years and years and years of single life to which to work really hard. And 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 he was married. And so he, he ended up, you know, we probably ended up publishing around the same amount of stuff. But he was moving at a slower pace because he had all his domestic responsibilities. So that's probably why you think of us being at the same time, because I, I kind of caught up because of my lack of domestic attachments. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so then going back to what we sort of t uh, touched on uh, at the very, very, very beginning, um, you're in Cairo in 2006 because you're doing CASA at the time? It was like your second stint? Yeah, CASA too. I'm okay. very grateful for that, that I was able to do that. This was a wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, We've mentioned so CASA I, on the show before with, when Dr. Jackson was on. Yeah. That's the uh, Center for Arabic Studies Abroad. Um, yeah. I, I believe it's a year it's a year long. Yeah, stretch so at a I time? did. I yeah. did Casa when I, I applied. So in college at Georgetown, I 
So I applied to CASA, and I had, at that time, exactly two Arabic grades on my transcripts. <laughs> I mean, I was in the middle of Arabic 2, and I had skipped the second semester of Arabic 1. <laughs> so I was, I, I had zero, I mean, I almost knew almost no Arabic when I went to college. I don't know, it, after that, they never would have let me in. I mean, that was before 9-11, so it was like the last year before 9-11. And uh, after that, it got much more competitive, but no one would have let me in. And anyway, so I got in and I went uh, to Cairo from June of 2000 to June of 2001. And because, I mean, it was a great situation because I had, you know, with languages, I think it's always better to be in over your head, but I was way over my head. So I had to, to uh, really learn fast and learn a lot. And that was, that year gave me the skills I needed to to really be able to do the things I wanted in, as a scholar. Right. And I also got to meet some scholars in Egypt who would become really, you know, important for my, my education. Um, many of them have died or become, let's just say politically problematic since then. Mm. But, uh, I certainly learned a lot from their, from their lessons. And, uh, Anyway, so that's what it's so Casa. But then when you met me, I was doing Casa Two, which is basically a kind of dissertation fellowship where you go and you they pay for you to do tutorials with scholars, like one on one tutorials. So I was doing I did three tutorials, three or two, I can't remember. I don't remember now. I think two tutorials. One was with uh a scholar named Mohammed Hamasa, who's since died. He died about a year and a half ago. He was a scholar of Arabic literature at um, Cairo University. I studied poetry and poetic meters and the sciences of different languages, of the Arabic sciences with him. And then um, I, the other one was with the scholar, and it was in Hadith, with the scholar named Osama Sayyid Mahmoud al-Azhari, who has since become very famous, but back He's then he was... The student was, of uh, student of Ali Guma, right? Yeah, yeah. At the yeah, time, yeah. he was he I was sat, sat in some durus with him at at yeah. Uh, at uh, 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 yeah yeah yeah. At the time, he was a he was getting famous, but he wasn't so famous that you couldn't get his time. And so, I was able to get a lot of his time because I was doing this tutorial with him, this kind of formal tutorial. And so, that I learned a lot in that time with him. And then I also studied other classes while I was there in Egypt as well. Uh, I think be, besides Egypt, you also do spend time in Yemen. Is that is that correct? I mean, you, yeah. You, so you I mean, I, I I don't want to make any uh, you know I don't want to make any claim. So what, when you read my bio, to to kind of a general audience, they wouldn't infer anything from that. I, I don't want to, but a Muslim audience would infer that. I want to. I don't want to make any claims that are not true, or even uh, you know imply anything that's not true. So my Islamic education, which is is not very strong. I mean, it's it's a limited, right? I mean, I I learned uh, Arabic. I did uh, studied a book called Shadur al-Dahab in grammar by Ibn Hisham with mm -hmm. Ibn Muhammad Hamasa. I studied uh, a book uh, a book of Fiqh al lugha by yeah. with uh, Ali Juma. And I studied a book of uh, Usul Fiqh, legal kind of legal theory or legal epistemology with a scholar named Sayyid Shaltut in Azhar. Yes. I studied uh, oh, about half of a book of Hanbali law with a scholar named uh, Musa Ferber in yes. Cairo. Right. I studied um, a lot of Ulum al lugha with Muhammad Hamasa. And I studied a lot of hadith with uh, Osama Sayyid Mahmoud. Um, and, but so that was really, I went to other places. Like I spent a few months, a few, I think maybe a month and a half in Yemen in 2007. Uh, but that was really, and I met a lot of scholars, but I, I didn't do any extended study. And I, I was mostly doing manuscript research there. So uh, every every other place I've been, I've met scholars and I've benefited from them, and you know, spent maybe a few days with them. But I wouldn't would not claim to have had any extensive study after that year, two thousand six. I mean, and I have ijazas to teach some some basic things, but not uh, not 
very high level stuff. Well, and can can you talk about? I mean, uh, obviously, um, you know, the the canonization of Al Bukhari and Muslim published in two thousand seven. What was the the road to that? I mean, the fir- first of of several books that you've had published. What, um, how did that come about? So that book, uh, I you know, I it was kind of t- answering that question that I had in my mind from that barbecue, which I told <laughs> you about, right? So. <laughs> Uh, which was, you know, who, who, what, what these two books slash entities, these like Bukhari and Muslim, I mean, what are they? Why are they so important? What's their role? Uh, what's their place in Islamic civilization? When, why, how does that happen? Uh, and what's their status? You know, can you criticize them? Can you not criticize them? What's their authority? Uh, so that was, th- this dissertation was kind of an answer to that question. And I, I couldn't believe someone hadn't answered that question before. I mean, I was doing my uh, master's. It was basically a master's thesis. They called a sec- They used to call it a second year paper. I don't know what it's called now. But I mean, I did it on this scholar who died in uh, 995, common era named Dara Qutni, Ali bin Omar Dara Qutni. He did, uh, he's from Baghdad. And he wrote this book where he criticizes about 215 or so narrations from Bukhari and Muslims books. Uh, these are very technical criticisms. They're not, you know, this hadith contradicts the Quran type. I mean, it's very, very technical about certain chains of transmissions about the hadiths. And so I was, I did my thesis on this book and on Dara Qutni, and I was, uh, I remember saying, oh, well, I just have to figure out, like, you know, had these books been canonized or not by that time? I didn't even think about what canonized meant. And I looked around, I was like, no one's actually done this before. So I said, well, that'll be my dissertation then. And that was my role, my dissertation. And Scott Lucas gave me great advice uh, when I started out my dissertation. He, well, he told me he wrote his dissertation like a book. He said, I, I, I sat down to write a book, not a dissertation. So that's what I did. I said, I'm going to write a book. And, uh, you know, that would mean it's sort of more bro- more more accessible, broader than a dissertation. Yeah, so right. I said to myself, until my until someone on my dissertation committee tells me to stop doing that, I'll just keep doing it. And I I didn't. No one told me to do anything, and I wrote basically my first book and my dissertation have about one sentence difference between them. And so wow. that was wow. uh, that was my um, yeah. It was an attempt to answer, you know, basically how do these book get get how do these two books get to the status they had? What was that status? What was its role? And how has it been changed or contested over time? Um, yeah, and, and I, you know, I'd, I'd love to kind of delve into that a little bit uh, more in terms of like your own, exp- you know, your own studies and expertise. I, I you know, I would submit um, in, in in terms of hadith, um, you know, the sort of idea of Islam as an interpretive tradition or hermeneutic, um, not unlike Judaism or Christianity, uh, with regards to the Old Testament, right? Which is basically, uh, and, and where and where hadith or sunnah comes into that as being a sort of an oral tradition that seeks to you know, provide that interpretive lens to the founding document, which in this case would be the Quran. Um, mm-hmm. so if you could maybe perhaps talk a little bit about that, which is not unlike, you know, if we're going to tie, tie uh, uh, you know, uh, other traditions in as well, not unlike American jurisprudence, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this would be the U.S. Constitution, and, you know, um, mm-hmm. The only difference there being that you rely on legal precedent and prior rulings. So uh, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'd love to kind of get kind of pick your brain on that as well um yeah well this is it, so this has a lot to do with you know the concept of canonization and so of course like any big term canonization and canons can mean a lot of different things uh but the way i focused on it was this the kind of and i i, I can't believe i actually remember this it's been so long since i thought about this but the the the, the interact the intersection of texts community and authority thank you and that's sort of what a can is sort of books that are authoritative for community and so they're they're both a way of creating a common kind of authoritative language for that community but also a way of defining the boundaries of that community through some kind of text body of work body of material um, so, you know, in the U.S., the, the, the decisions, the Constitution and then the decisions of the Supreme Court or uh, the Old the Old Testament and then, you know, 
the New Testament as a lens of reading that through. Uh, these are canons. Mm-hmm. But th- as you as you said, I mean, the, the kind of with with interpretive traditions, revealed traditions, um, and then you know even some legal traditions, right? You have you have kind of a original scripture which is either originally written or very quickly written down, like the Old Testament, the Quran, uh, and then you have this secondary scripture which comes to explain and control and right. understand and add to that r- r- primary scripture. And that secondary scripture oftentimes, at least in the Abrahamic tradition, is actually not written down for a long time because uh, when you write something down, you lose control of it. And uh, when something is written, it's subject to misunderstanding. Right. So, uh, you know, Plato has a great line, I think, in, in his Phaedrus dialogue where he says, you know, books don't, um, when something is written, written words don't, you don't, they don't teach you, you read what you want into them, right? So if, if you, a book doesn't talk to you, or talk back to you, it doesn't answer questions, it's almost a, a tool of the reader. Right. And so if you don't have an oral tradition that to explain and kind of guide interaction with that book, then the book just becomes a, a a uh, vehicle for misunderstanding. Um, so that's why, but then of course the problem is that as time goes on, you also risk losing control or forgetting or uh, not being able to preserve that secondary oral tradition. And so that also has to get written down. And that's what happens in Christianity, that's what happens in Judaism, that's what happens in Islam. Um, that's what happens in uh, even Chinese Zen Buddhism. Right. Uh, and so this is... Uh, a typical process. Uh, but then, of course, even even when you write down that secondary scripture, when in Islam's case, it's the sunnah, even when you write that down, you still need people to explain what's written. You know, so even no matter no matter what happens, no matter how much you try and set things down on paper to preserve them or to clarify them, you always need living voices to explain and to teach those things. That's right. So then... Um, and 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 then so, ah, uh, wow. Uh, I, I want to get into so much, but uh, so so then in your so then in your opinion, what is then the sunnah, right? I mean, we can say we can safely say that the sunnah is or the reposit like the the reposit the sunnah. Or, sorry, what am I trying to say? The repository of the sunnah <laughs> is the hadith. Okay, the repository of the sunnah is the hadith literature, right? And we'll get into that in just a second, but. What, in your opinion, then, is the sort of like, the, like, how would you define Sunnah, right? Is it? Uh, yeah, the sun, So the reason the I sunnah, raise that is because there's a. I think there's always. Would you agree that there's been a tension of like sort of isolated hadith versus normative practice or communal practice, right? Mm. Um, uh, or in the case of like the Maliki school and the Medinan school, you've got the Amal of Medina, which is a sort of communal mm. practice that seeks to. Um, that, that that provides that lens, right? Um, and then there's the whole existing tension between isolated hadith versus does that comprise the normative practice? Um, and there's so many examples that Dr. Jackson, I know, talks about, uh, which I think I was listening to a lecture the other day, and I think you you actually quoted one of the examples that Dr. Jackson often uses about the husband coming home with a rose for his wife, and every day that's that's his practice. But uh, the, on the rare occasions that he doesn't show up at the house or on the one particular occasion where he shows up at the house without a rose uh, and someone is there to witness that, um, that becomes recorded as your as something that occurred. But that mm-hmm. isn't necessarily a normative practice. So maybe kind of talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'd love to. Uh, yeah, so the, def- the general understanding of the sunnah, the best definition I've heard is from one of my teachers in Egypt, um, Sheikh Ali Jumah. Who said it's tatbiqun ma'sumun li kitabillah? It's a uh, infallible application of the book of God. So the Sunnah mm. is the Prophet's infallible application of the Quran's teachings. So it add, it explains, it applies, it adds to uh, the the Quran, and it and it can also abrogate the Quran. Right. Um, the it's so in if you wanted to kind of just give a shorter definition you would say that the sunnah is the prophet's authoritative precedent mm, okay um and 
so the, there's two kind of big debates. You could two big questions here. Yes. One is what's the role of the Sunnah in Islam? And until the 20th century, basically, the late 1800s, the early 1900s, uh, no one ever debated that the Sunnah was absolutely essential for understanding Islam. Whether Sunnis or Shiites, whether uh, even, you know, Aga Khani and even, sorry, Ismailis um, would say you need the Sunnah to understand the Quran and to understand Islam. They just disagree on what that Sunnah is. Okay, so... Um, it's only in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s that you actually have some Muslim Islamic modernists who say that the Sunnah itself is unnecessary. And I think those, are, those claims are internally inconsistent and not sustainable claims. Um, uh, but the second bigger, so, the, but one, so one question then is, you know, what's the interaction between the Quran and the Sunnah? And that's a big generator of of, of kind of discourse in the Islamic, a lot of the kind of matter of Islamic tradition is created by this discussion of what's the proper interaction between the Quran and the Sunnah to, to answer questions about what Muslims should believe and what Muslims should do or not do. Then the second issue is what, how do you understand the Sunnah? What makes up the Sunnah? And here you have a couple of different, uh, prince, different schools of thought. Uh, one school of thought is that, well, the sunnah is made up of little pieces of information, which are the hadith. So, you know, what better way to know what the Prophet's authoritative precedent is, uh, alayhi salatu salam, than to just collect little reports about all these different things he said and did and things that were done around him. And then you put that together and you kind of sort which ones are general, which ones are specific, which comes first, which comes later. And then that's the sunnah. Um, another answer is... No, no, no. That's that. Another answer is um, no. The sunnah is kind of a, a, a methodology of problem solving. If you want to think, I think that's the best way to put it. Is you know, that the Prophet at least had a certain way of thinking, a certain way of addressing issues, a certain way of answering questions, a certain, um, and that that gets passed on to his companions and to their successors and to their successors uh, until the early imams like Abu Hanifa and Malik, and they. That, that basically fiqh is, or Islamic jurisprudence is just this application of a tradition of problem solving, and that's the sunnah of the Prophet. Um, another approach is to think about, well, the sunnah of the Prophet is this communal practice of the Muslim community. Um, you know, so, well, how do people learn how to pray? They learn how to pray from their parents. They learn how to, learn how to pray from their parents. Back, 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 all the way to the Prophet. And that's the kind of Maliki idea of the Amal of the people of Medina, the practice of the people of Medina, that the Sunnah is a good way of understanding the Sunnah is through the actual practice of that community mm -hmm. that was created by the Prophet and was formed around him. Um, and these, in actuality, every school of law in Islam accepts all three of these uh, to one degree or the other. We associate some of them with, you know, we think of communal practice is Maliki, we think of kind of traditional problem solving of, you know, analogy is more Hanafi and, you know, Hadith is more Shafi and Hanbali. But in fact, every one of those schools takes every one of the types of thinking of Sunnah that I just gave you. It's just a matter of emphasis that they have, different emphasis. Right, right. Um, so then, uh, like, going back to the, the, the idea of the example of like sort of the isolated Hadith, right? Uh, do is it? Would you agree that some of the schools then characterize all of the, even those isolated reports as being, uh, a, to use your uh, definition, authoritative precedent of the prophet, or do they still kind of look at view those within the over frame, you know, the overall framework of the the, the corpus of hadith that's out there? So it really depends. On the context, so okay. if you have if you have something, let's say you have, you know, the Quran has uh, a lot of verses that deal with inheritance, mm -hmm. um, unlike uh, most other is issues of law. Uh, the Quran actually has a lot to say about that, and they're very highly technical and yeah, and, I mean, yeah, and very exactly. specific rules. That's right. right? So That's very right. Very specific rules. So um, you know the 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 idea that you know, you can't um, marry uh, two sisters um, 
and you can't marry a woman and her sister. I'm exactly. sorry, that's not that's not inheritance, but let's just think about a family law. That way. Within, within, yeah, let's just think the yeah, purview. Uh, of the, so you know, in that case, you know, in in that case, you know, you're gonna probably. What, what am I? Let me think about what I'm trying to say a bit more specifically. So what I mean to say is that if you if you come across a hadith where there's no other evidence, you know, there's nothing in the Quran. There's nothing. You know, that's probably going to play a larger role than something where you have a lot of Quranic evidence. Um, and if you have a lot of different hadiths on an issue, then you're going to have to choose. You know, are some of these reliable and others unreliable? Are some of them specific and some of them general? Uh, you know, and and if you have an issue where you have, let's say, um, lots a hadith that seems to contradict what you have come up with as a general legal principle, then you need to decide. Well, are you going to say that the hadith is somehow unreliable or non-representative, and you stick with the legal principle, or do you say well, we're going to alter the legal principle? In this case, this is an exception. We're going to say this hadith. We still take the hadith. So, what I mean to say is that it really depends on. The overall, the, all the different evidence you're looking at, you know, how much you're going to authorize or how much authority you're going to grant any one hadith. Uh, it just, you know, to, to give maybe a couple of examples, um, if you say that, um, you know, you know the, 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 the Quran says, you know, you can't marry a woman and, and her sister at the same time. Uh, and what's you know what other than that is permitted for you? The Quran says so. What now? Uh, anything other than that is so. In theory, any other you know you could marry a woman and her aunt together at the same time. Um, this is assuming you know we're talking about men here, not women. But um, then no, the hadiths prohibit the prophet. You know the hadith prohibits someone marrying a woman and her aunt at the right. same time. And so that you could see that is, a, is that a contradiction? The Quran says, you know, any other thing than this is permitted for you. But in fact, this hadith say no. Actually, there's another thing that's that's prohibited. So you could say, well, this hadith contradicts the Quran. But that's not how Muslim scholars understood that. Almost uniformly, they understood it as an additional restriction. Correct. Um, and then you know you could actually, and, and then sometimes you can get a restriction that doesn't even have any basis in scripture. Like the fact that you can't, if um, sorry for those who are listening who can't deal with this stuff, but you know, if, if you have a concubine, someone has a concubine, you can't marry, you can't have a concubine and the sister of that concubine as your concubine as well. Uh, and there's not any hadiths about that or any kind. This is just an analogy on the basis of that that you you can't marry a woman or her sister, therefore you can't have a concubine and her sister as a concubine. Um, in other situations, you have. Uh, Let's let's say, uh, um, you know, like uh, what's called disc discretionary punishment, or ta it's called just tazir punishment. Right. So this is the the vast majority of the vast 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 majority of any punishments carried out in Islamic civilization were tazir punishments. Anything that's not a hud crime that doesn't meet the very almost impossibly high evidentiary bar of the hudud crimes, like you know, where you'd have your hand chopped off or something like that, you're going to get punished by HUD crime. And Islamic civilization, the main form of punishment was some kind of corporal punishment, like lashing or bastinado or getting your feet hit by the stick or something. Um, and the prophet says, here you have a, a couple you have different evidence. So the prophet in one case says, in one hadith says that there's no, no lashing above 10 lashes except for a HUD crime. So that sets this bar. And so um, in the case of uh, the, uh, like the, I think in the, in the in a main opinion in the Shafi school, they said, you can't go over 10 lashes for a HUD crime, or for a, for a Tazir crime. In the Hanafi school, they, they basically said, well, we have these instances of uh, or the companions punishing people, let's say for, 39 lashes for intoxication when it wasn't a, when they were and there wasn't a lot of evidence the person had drunk something but they would say okay so anything that's below the hud punishment is an acceptable tazir in the hanbali school they stuck much closer to the hadith so they'd say you can only have 10 maximum of 10 lashes 
But then if there's an example of, let's say, one of the companions carrying out a punishment, so or say one time Omar, the second caliph, lashed a woman 99, or lashed a man 99 times for committing adultery. So they say in that, in that case, you can do 99. So there, what I'm trying to say is that you see different approaches. One approach is you stick, you just say there's a hadith, that's the rule, we stick to it. Another right. approach is actually let's look at the early community and they're actually telling us how to practice this, which is that anything below the Hyde punishment is acceptable. And then the, Han the Hanbali school is saying, let's try and come up with a general rule, but then any time we find, sorry, well, let's stick to the Hadith, but any time we find an early example of, of that differs with that rule, we're going to make an exception for that early example and follow it. So these are different approaches to the scripture. Um, I, you know, um, I, I think just by way of your examples, you, you you raise a lot of the sort of issues that confront at least moderns, uh, modern Muslims with regards to the issues of Islamic law that are problematized. And I know you deal with this in your in your most recent book, misquoting Muhammad. Um, so I definitely want to get to that. And uh, but but before we leave the topic of hadith, I, I think because because you've raised it, and I and this is one of the things I did want to talk about as well, is you know we talk about sort of grading hadith, or if a if a if a hadith is reliable or weak or 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 forged, uh, m maybe if you could before we like I said pivot away from this topic, um, you know talk about um, you know the the whole sort of enterprise of grading hadith and maybe where tawatur fit, fits into that. The only reason I raised Tawatur is because, I mean, I don't know, if, uh, Jack, uh, um, you know, our, our, the very name of our show is sort of diffuse congruence, which is like Dr. Jackson's way of uh, sort of explaining the idea of Tawatur in, in, in Muslim mm. tradition. So, so I, I, you know, that's the only reason I asked that in particular as well. But uh, mm. maybe kind of tie all that in and then, and then we'll kind of, like I said, use this to, to pivot to some of, the, some of the areas that you cover in your most recent book. Um. Well, I think that what I just said is really boring. I'm sorry for that. But anyway, no, no, no. I, I think, you know, to be honest with I, you, you and I could get, I mean, I feel like I could geek out with you and, 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 and we could spend hours, but, I, you know, I, I don't want to lose our listeners either. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> so the basically the Tawatot to, to is, you know, I guess well, one definition I usually use is like massive, massively, massive parallel transmission. So... Mm -hmm. It's this idea that you hear a report, you hear a piece of information so much that it becomes certain to you. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the standard example given, you know, classical books of Islamic epistemology would be, you know, the existence of China. So, I mean, I've never been, well, I guess I went to Hong Kong, but I've never been to China proper. So I don't, you know, for all I know, actually China doesn't exist. I have no direct experience that China exists, I've, but I've seen so many movies and heard so many news stories and blah, 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 that, I mean, it, it's impossible. It, it is, it is a absolute certainty that China exists. So this is, this is a, the kind of the definition of Tuatha, which is that it's massive, massively parallel transmission that creates certainty. And uh, here we, we have to keep in mind that, you know, when Muslim scholars elaborate their epistemology, they're doing so after having absorbed kind of the Near Eastern, Greco-Roman, Persian traditions of epistemology and logic. And so they really, they basically do this weird combination where they combine a lot of the details of Islamic law, which they'd already developed, and then an epistemology, which is actually totally foreign, mm -hmm. and which actually doesn't really match the details of their law. So... You have this problem where, you know, um, let's say the number of hadiths that are transmitted widely enough to meet the standard definitions of tuatur are, you know, maybe one hadith. I mm -hmm. mean, according to legal theorists. So, uh, what is that? <laughs> so, every other hadith is basically, doesn't give you certainty, it just gives you strong probability of That's right. that, that, that the prophet said this statement. Um, now, that was no problem in law because they said in law, you only need strong probability of evidence that some, in order to construct a law. But in theology, when it comes to talking about the nature of God and things like that, then you're supposed to have certainty because the Quran constantly tells people not to follow dhan, not to follow probability, but to stick to revelation uh, when it comes to the nature of God and how you're supposed to worship God. So, they had this problem, which is all the a lot of the 
items of Sunni theology which are not in the Quran, like, let's say, the return of Jesus, the coming of the Antichrist, uh, details about the Day of Judgment, things like that. None of these are in the Quran, at least not explicitly in any way. Right. And so, how can you justify having them as theological tenets mm -hmm. if they're not based on epistemologically certain evidence? So they came up with a variety of ways of trying to fix this gap, which one of which was to say, well, it doesn't matter if the hadiths are not mutawatir because we're, there's consensus on them, and when the Muslim community comes to consensus on something, it becomes certain. Uh, but then the problem is, of course, that the evidence for that belief is itself a hadith, which is not mutawatir, so you have a, it sort of dissolves into circular argument. So then one argument was that, oh, well, look, it's just people, it's not possible for a whole community to agree on something without it being true, just in general, you know? Like, it's, if, if uh, you know, that battle between Superman and General Zod or whatever happened in Metropolis, you know, it's not possible that all these people saw that and it didn't actually happen. Right. So that they you, the entire, yeah, the entire yeah. population of Metropolis saw this battle happening between these two aliens destroying buildings right, left and center, and there's buildings flying everywhere, and Batman's friends get killed, and all this stuff. You know, <laughs> then it's not, you know, that had that. That's not possible that this uh, did not happen. Right. Um. So that was sort of a the the best the end argument that they could make for the legitimacy of consensus, and then that then becomes. Uh, an argument for taking hadith that would otherwise be, prob be probabilistic and elevating to the level of certainty based on consensus. Of course, the difference is that with consensus on hadith, you're talking about m a relatively small number of scholars coming to consensus on something, not the entire population of the East Coast or something. So uh, when it comes to hadiths, it gets even more complicated because people, scholars will use the word mutawatir or, you know, diffusely congruent hadiths to describe hadiths, even though there no one is going to claim they met, they meet the, the legal theorist's definition of tawatur, diffuse mm -hmm. congruence. So it actually in hadiths, in the study of hadith, there's, a, there's kind of a parallel jargon where the same term is used, but it doesn't have the same uh, strength. So you'll regularly hear people say, oh, that hadith's mutawatir, but what that really means is basically that a lot of Muslim scholars, maybe all, think that it's, it's, it's widely transmitted enough to be certain in its truth. But uh, it, that doesn't mean that that, uh, that meets the standards of legal theorists. But anyway, that's a, that's a separate issue. But, I mean, uh, th this actually kind of creates um, oh, an, es an escape valve or an escape route sometimes when Muslim scholars are confronted with hadiths that they can't really accept for one reason or the other. So, you know, a good example of this is in um, in Sahih Muslim, there's a hadith that which the Prophet basically tells a man that his the man's father is in hellfire. And that the man and that then the Prophet says his own father is in hellfire. The problem is that the Prophet's father died before he was born. And so the Prophet never Met, never heard about Islam, never had a chance to believe in Islam. He lived in a time when there was no prophecy, when there's no correct religion in Arabia. And uh, one of the principles that Muslim scholars derived early on from the Quran is this idea that you know you're not responsible, you're not going to be punished by God for not believing in a religion if you never had a chance to learn about that religion. And so this hadith seems to contradict that. And uh, it's in Sahih Muslim, it's a, considered to be a sound hadith, uh, but so a lot of scholars would just say, about, I mean, a lot of leading scholars like Asiyuti and Bajuri in the 1800s, they just said, well, it's not mutawatir. It's not, it's, even if it's authentic, it's simply not strong enough to overcome what we consider to be a, an absolutely certain theological principle, which is that you're not going to be punished for something you didn't have a chance to learn about. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think basically, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't want the listeners to feel as though, like I said, we are getting into the weeds because I think, at least in my experiences, a lot of the issues that you're talking about, uh, uh, Dr. Brown, are, are, are things that um, 
you know that 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 uh, unfortunately or uh, you know just sort of Muslim laity they don't get into these. No, types. this is not the weeds. I mean, this is uh, yeah. This is, I mean, this I know. is the stuff that uh, people. Right. I mean, just the other day I was right. you know on some Facebook debate getting a lot of these things. I, I the, this <laughs> this guy was saying. I mean, when it for the, comes to issues like apostasy, yeah. So. Um, I know the the Quran says la ikraha fi din. There's no compulsion in religion. So you know, if you read the Quran, you would say, you know, if someone decides that they're not Muslim anymore, how can that possibly? Be? You know, they might be making a big mistake. But I mean, if there's no compulsion in religion, then how can you possibly punish them for this decision? Right. Uh, and then, well, people say, well, there's there's all these hadiths that talk about the death penalty for apostasy, and. Uh, the, the answer of, you know, the person who says that, you know, I don't accept this is that these, how can you take these hadiths, even if they're in reliable hadith collections, how can you take them as they seem to contradict this, this principle in the Quran? Uh, and kind of the people who defend those hadiths say, well, there's all sorts of things that we, where we, we allow hadith to supersede the Quran, for example, I'm not allowed to marry my, my wife and my wife's aunt. I mean, sorry to keep going to that example, but I mean, just we already used it. I mean, so the, like, I, we don't get, we don't flip out about that contradicting the Quran, do we? I mean, so um, yeah. there's, uh, but then people would say, you know, so I think actually these these issues are behind a lot of the big debates Muslims have that, Agreed. you know, on the news and in, in their daily lives. Uh, so, uh, that's really, you know, that's why I got into studying this stuff is because these debates all end up going back to these very in the weeds questions. I agree. I agree. Um, which I think serves as, as a great segue, if any, um, to kind of talk about uh, a lot of these issues that you do talk about um, that are in the news that are often problematized in, 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 in especially uh, for Muslims living in the West or just by Western audiences uh, or our Western interlocutors in terms of uh, you know, uh, the, the type of issues that you talk about in misquoting Muhammad. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the sort of genesis of that book. And, and, and uh, uh, I, 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 I can't help but mention the fact that the misquoting Muhammad is sort of a play on, um, uh, who was it, Bert, Bert er Ehrman's book, right, misquoting Jesus, right, which, which mm. he was a New Testament scholar. Um, uh, maybe kind of talk, you know, to talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so that's uh, um, you know, that was uh, the dis the suggestion of the publisher. They said, okay. you know, Bart Ehrman wrote this book, Misquoting Jesus. You should write one called Misquoting Muhammad. I said, I don't really want to because he write. You know, his books are about you know how Text. right G Jesus wasn't or no one originally he was God. He was this like you know radical preacher. And I mean, it's not. I don't have anything against his scholarship, but. I, I don't agree with that approach to early Islamic studies because right. uh, I don't think that we have any evidence for these type of claims about the early Islamic period. And instead, we just in, sort of indulge our own narrative that you know early Islam must be like early Christianity, even though we don't have any evidence for that. That's so right. I, I was like, I don't want to write that book. But uh, the guy, the editor said, well, you know, OK, then write it more like, you know, contesting Muhammad, contesting mm -hmm. his legacy. Oh, I was like, OK, that's, that's actually sounds something I, I could write. Uh, and then, but anyway, that's the title. But the, the, for me, the real title of the book is the subtitle, which is, yeah, uh, what was it? Uh, the challenge and choices. Challenges and churches. Uh, challenge and choices of interpreting the prophet's legacy. Yeah. So uh, this really came out of a lot of just giving lectures, uh, especially public lectures, in the first couple of years that I was a professor, and and realizing you know you just I was end up dealing with the same issues over and over again, and. I wanted to kind of put these out there for people to read about, and I wanted to do it in a way that um, was accessible and well written, and kind of almost with a narrative that you could identify with, and characters and things like that. So I don't know if you read the book *The Mantle of the Prophet* by Roy Matahide. Yeah. So it was really um, kind of like I wanted to make it like a Sunni kind of Sunni Islam version of. The, the, the mantle of the prophet. Ah. Uh, so that's what I set out to do. I see. And, uh, right. and then I, I, so, you know, there's all sorts of 
you know, if you want to talk about how you understand scripture and, and debates over hadiths and the Quran and stuff, it, it, to get into this, you have to give the person a background of Islamic intellectual history. And I wanted this book to be readable by anybody. Right. Um, and so I, I, it's the first chapter is the first main chapter is, is actually kind of a history of Islam. It's like a history of Islamic intellectual history up until the early modern period. And I, that's there to give background to sort of introduce all the concepts that someone would need if they read the rest of the book. And then the other parts of the, you know, the book deal with uh, kind of Islamic hermeneutics, uh, scriptural interpretation, uh, the challenge that that faces with the advent of modernity and the confrontation with the modern West, the different splintering sort of schools of thought that Muslims splinter into in, in um, meeting this challenge. And then some of the, the bigger questions about truth and reality that, that come uh, from these, the, the, the Islamic scriptural tradition. Yeah, I mean, I, I I can't I can't recommend it enough. It's it's an it's a it's a, it's a wonderful addition to I think any um, certainly any Muslim living in, in the West uh, in terms of like sort of tackling uh, or 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 how the book sort of tackles how Muslims have historically navigated you know their fidelity to the to to the to the, to the tradition through changing sort of times and modernity and other things that they're having to deal with um, uh, and 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 you do so within the context of some of the most sort of controversial and contentious issues you know uh, uh, according to Muslims and uh, and Western audiences so I, I, I yeah highly recommended um, if if we could sort of leave out you know I, I know we've talked a lot and I and I and I, uh, I don't want to take too much more of your time uh, but perhaps to sort of close out. Um, in terms of uh, the book, uh, really quickly, I, I know that one of the areas that you also talk about is uh, sort of modern reformist movements, uh, and you know, some violent, some not so violent. But you know, we talk mm -hmm. about sort of the Salafist, uh, the, the Salafi approach, as well as extreme violent extremist groups like ISIS and you know, uh, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, etc., um, where they, I think, what you're essentially saying in the book is that. They're quoting Muhammad accurately, uh, so they're not misquoting Muhammad to draw on the title of the book, but they're doing so in a highly truncated manner, uh, right, which is sort of stripped of any sort of modern, uh, or I'm sorry, that, that's sort of stripped of the, of, the, of the entire edifice of the Muslim tradition, 1400 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And so what results so, is, is a prophet that is just seen as this sort of, you know. So I think, I think yeah. one of the, the, the problem... I mean, let's forget about Salafists or not Salafists. I actually don't think that Salafism is really just a kind of modern sort of handbalism. It's yeah. not, I don't think Salafis are that different from other people uh, in the sense that the, the stuff you're talking about. Um, what I would say is that right. Right. Uh, that when we talk about violence groups, uh, really what we're, t I think it's not really about a specific approach to scripture. It's more mm. the way that we understand the role of Islamic law in society. And what okay. I mean by that is if you, um, so, you know, in theory, in theory, and a great example of this is there's this famous, he's a Moroccan scholar. He's from Morocco originally, but he ends up visiting what's today like Timbuk, Timbuktu in the, the early 1500s, a uh, scholar named Maghili. And he basically goes there and he's sort of very kind of doctrinaire, uh, you know, ivory tower, orthodox Muslim scholar. And he goes there and he, he see, you know, the, the king of Mali says, you know, my people are Muslim, but they, you know, they, the women walk around naked until they're married and they don't divide their inheritance by... Islamic law, they, et cetera, et cetera, what should I do? And he says, oh, well, you just tell them to do that or, 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 or you have to kill them. I mean, my, his point being, if you, if you don't, if you deny something that is known essentially to be part of Islam, then you're an unbeliever. That's the classic, the standard Muslim position, right? So if, for example, I say I don't have to pray five times a day, that would make me an unbeliever because I'm denying something that is absolutely part of known as part of the religion. So if, if these people in Mali say we don't have to divide our, our inheritance by Islamic law, 
then they're technically not Muslims. And if they were previously Muslims and now they're not Muslims, then they are apostates and they should be killed. That's, that's the, uh, the, the, the thinkers, the, the scholars logic. And everything he's saying is correct technically, right? But it's of course completely, it is not taking consideration at all the context, which is that these people have very little understanding of their religion. They have, it's seeped very little into their culture. And that, you know, that's not how you educate people. So, that's I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of times people think that, you know, extremism comes from, or some violent extremism. I don't like the term extremism because extremism just means ideas that are unpopular. And what is unpopular or popular in any one given place and time has absolutely no necessary link to anything that's actually morally wrong or violent or anything like that. But, I mean, let's just say violent extremism. You know, the violent extremism sort of comes from misreading of texts or misreading of scriptures. And I think that's, you know, a, a lot of the times that's not the case. I think that it's more a failure to understand how or to take, let's say, a, a productive approach um, of implementing rules in society and implementing kind of orthodox understandings of uh, law in, in a society that might be, you know, very far off from, from that understanding. And, I mean, I, I always think a great example of this is uh, in the, the late 1400s, there's this Moroccan scholar who's, you know, very kind of standard, orthodox, you know, uh, intellectual alim you know, uh, from Morocco, and he travels to what's uh, to Timbuktu, and he basically has this meeting with uh, the, the sultan of Timbuktu, who's this very powerful man named Askia Muhammad, but who's also very religiously devout, and he's kind of committed to trying to bring his people, who are nominally Muslim, trying to bring them more actually into a practice of Islam uh, at a society-wide level. And so he's telling um, the scholar, the Moroccan scholar's name is Al-Maghili, Muhammad Al-Maghili, he starts telling him, you know, my people do this and, the, you know, they don't divide up their inheritance according to Islamic law and the women walk around naked until they get married and they go and they look at, you know, they, they seek out uh, soothsayers and they go and they say, you know, the fox said this and the duck said that or whatever. And uh, he asked, you know, he asked the scholar, what, what, that, what does that mean? What should you do about it? And the scholar basically says, well, that's all kufr. And basically, if you tell them to that this is not Islamic, that they have to stop. If they don't stop, then you, you basically are entitled to kill them because they've denied things that are essentially part of the religion of Islam. And that's technically correct. Um, but it completely, <laughs> completely fails to realize the social reality of these people's, of these people's religious lives, right? It's not, they're not, they're, they're Muslim nominally. Okay. But they, if you go and you tell them that they have to change the way they're living or they have to change the way they, they divide up their inheritance and, and that's just what Islam says, that, you know, that doesn't convince them. Nobody, nobody's ever convinced when someone just comes and starts telling them what to do. You have to ease them into why this is the way they have to do it, why they have to accept this understanding, what the Quran is, what the Sunnah is, how, how these sources work. You know, you have to ease people into understanding of their religion. You can't just go and, and sort of caulk this orthodoxy of the world on top of them. And then say that they're denying it if they don't accept it. I mean, that's not how human beings work. And so what you see is, you know, in these, like, the kind of movements of revival and reform, which shake the Muslim world in the 1700s, like the, well, I mean, this is not a technically accurate term, but people call it the Wahhabi movement in Central Arabia or the Sokoto Caliphate in uh, what's now northern, mostly northern Nigeria, and uh, also the movement of Shah Wali Allah in India and Sanani in Yemen, like these movements, they all have similar ideas about getting Muslims to go back to, or maybe even learn for the first time, their true practice of their religion and not engage in worshiping idols or things like that, or, you know, to really kind of revive and re revive Islam in these places. But if you look at, you know, movements like the Wahhabi movement, their, their, ide their ideology, you know, they basically go and they say, you know, they'll go to a tribe and they'll say, okay, you guys have to start practicing Islam as we see it because we have the correct version. And you guys are actually worshiping trees and rocks, which they, which they were, okay? 
and you guys are you guys are actually not Muslim, even though you think you are. And by the way, they were not Muslim according to any rational standard. Of, I mean, they were really worshiping trees and rocks and a lot of these tribes in Central, Central Arabia. And basically, go and tell them, you know, accept our dawah or we're going to kill you because you're claimed to be Muslims and you're actually kafirs, so you can be, you know, you're effectively apostates. You're like the mushrikeen that the Prophet fought, alayhi salam, during the t- the, his time. And the Quran right. gives you permission to fight them. I mean, they, remember, they were really actually in the exact same place the Prophet was, fighting exactly the same thing he was fighting, namely the mushrikeen of Central Arabia. So, right. that you look at that attitude and, you know, I mean, it, it as opposed to basically saying, let's say the attitude of someone like Shah Wali Allah, which was, we have to educate people. Mm-hmm. We have to educate. I mean, we can't just go and, t- if you go to a group, especially a group of Bedouins, who are really proud people who don't like being told what to do, okay? you go and you tell them, you guys are totally wrong in the way you're understanding everything. You need to do the things our way, or, or we're going to fight. I mean, what do you think, how do you think they're going to react? How do you think people re- usually react to that? So I think a lot of the time that, you know, extremism isn't, really about, you know, I've derived a rule from scripture that is wrong. It's, we actually might agree on that rule. It's just how do you actually get people to follow that rule? Do you sort of go and beat them over the head with it? Or do you educate them into an understanding of it? And I think that's a lot of times in Islamic history and today, right? Uh, extremism, sort of un- unacceptable or violent extremism, isn't about someone having a bad belief. It's about someone not understanding how to implement that belief in a society. Correct. So in terms of like approach, uh, like what is the approach towards reform? Um, yeah, and, exactly. And, I mean, and just, yeah. just, just as another counterexample, in, in the, what became really the dominant approach to teaching Islam in West Africa, and this was started in the 1400s and 1500s, uh, I think it was called the Jakhanke system, developed in places like Senegal and Mali in that time period. They had a couple of really important premises. Of was one was that people um, kufr exists or disbelief exists because of ignorance, not because of uh, evil. Right. So people, if people are not, are not doing something wrong, it's because they're ignorant. It's not because they're bad. Right? It's mm-hmm. not because they're intentionally denying something. And you and you, and the, the main job of scholars is to educate them. First and foremost, you go and educate. You don't force. You don't compel. You don't even take political power. You go even and live under non-Muslim uh, chiefs and rulers, and you basically try and educate people about Islam until they get to the point where they start practicing and understanding what the duties and requirements that they they have are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think what further complicates this whole, you know, like these, let's say, seemingly opposite approaches is that both seem to be able to justify their approach uh, by the sources. I mean, I, I think, I think so. I think so, but it's a very uh, this maybe is a good example of select, you know, kind of bad interpretation. I mean, the uh, the only place, the only place that I know of, and you know, I've looked around a lot, that Muslims are actually allowed to force people to basically convert or die, is the case of the. Mushrikun of Central Arabia, the polytheists of Central Arabia. Uh, everyone else is even polytheists outside of Arabia, like let's say Hindus or something like that, or the animist religions of West Africa, they were treated as people of the book, which meant that you couldn't, you know, you, you couldn't force them to convert to Islam or die. Um, the other, uh, the second issue is, you know, this question of people and this is actually something that is, that's, I think, coming up today, is this idea of people denying things that are known essentially as part of the religion or um, axiomatic tenets of the faith. In, in Arabic, it's al-ma'lum uh, min ad These mm-hmm. are things that are known essentially as tenets of, like, for example, there's one God, uh, there's a day of judgment, there's angels, the Quran, the finality of the Prophet, the prophet there's five prayers, zina is haram, intoxication is haram. These things, everybody says. And if, 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 you, if you don't, if you drink alcohol, you're just a, a bad Muslim. I mean, you could drink alcohol every day until you pass out, and then you're just a bad Muslim. But if you say, I'm allowed to drink alcohol, correct? then that would be denying something that's known essentially as part of the religion. And the, the agreed agreement of Muslim scholars, present or you know, as far back as 
we know is that if you do that, then you've left Islam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't, so the problem is that if you take something like, um, I mean, two things, one thing like hijab and the other thing being, uh, let's say homosexual relationships. So for, or let's just say liwat, just sodomy. Let's just take that as an example, because it's very clear. So, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, every Muslim scholars, all schools of law, cross Sunni and Shiism, all thought that women were required to cover their hair when they're out in front of strange men. Um, and all also believe that sodomy is prohibited. So if you go and say that um, hijab is not required and sodomy is permitted, then that's actually denying things that are known essentially as part of the religion. But of course, I mean, we, we look around today in the Muslim community, in almost anywhere in the world, and there's lots of people, women and men, who don't think that the hijab is required, and who do think that homosexuality is permissible. Um, So the question is, you know, do you say you guys have ceased to be Muslim because you believe this, or do you, which would technically be correct, or do you say, hmm, let's look at basically what has led us into this cultural situation, right? So in the case of uh, the hijab, you have colonial experience, you have all sorts of discourse about gender and interpretation and people advancing arguments that, you know, the the hadiths on it are unreliable and the the Quranic verses are unambiguous and it's actually just preaching modesty. So, you know, at this point, you you, you know, something like that, it's, it's, I would actually argue that it's, it's not really an axiomatic tenet of the religion anymore. It's actually something that's been, even though maybe that debate isn't very solid, it's actually become a real issue of debate and that people can believe that hijab is not required and not have kind of exited the bounds of religion. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this another interesting thing. When you look That's at fascinating. Like, so like you're saying like things that, are, things that are non, like the things that would traditionally be seen as non-negotiables, right? Like, like yeah. for example, to you to simplify your um, term. Exactly, exactly. Uh, non-negotiables can over time based on the fact that now the community, because of, let's say, context, whatever the reasons may be, are now having conversations around how non-negotiable is that non-negotiable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and by the way, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that that actually right, has right. any merit, right? So, right. I mean, I, I feel bad using hijab as an example, cause, but I mean, <laughs> you know, let's no, take no. just, I let's mean, take like, a, so but well, the, my, my point is that lots of, lots of, Lots of, let's say, Muslim girls grow up today in devout Muslim households with devout Muslim parents and every aspect of their religion they're extremely serious about. And they believe that it's not required for them to wear hijab. And and so at that point, yeah, I think that you can say that whether or not you agree with their position, you can't just say, oh, you're denying somebody that's uh, a non-negotiable. Therefore, you've actually left Islam. I mean, at that point, that simply becomes, even though that might technically be true historically, Mm-hmm. It just when you if you if you insist on saying that today, you're simply denying what has become a cultural reality that you need to deal with. And if you want to convince these girls and these boys that hijab is required, then you're going to actually have to go and kind of win back that ground. That's through, right through the process of education and argumentation. Mm, like the market, yeah, e- enter the marketplace of ideas, as it were. Yeah, you um, can't. Yeah, yeah, you can't. You know. Yeah, exactly. Let me ask you then. Finally. Um, because that's a great example, and, and I know one that whether – fill in the blank, whether it's hijab, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's uh, – I don't know, uh, you know, even as simple as like participating in Western you know, liberal democracy, whatever may be the case, mm-hmm. right? Notions of citizenship. Um, how much of what you're talking about relates to this issue of ijma and the, and the idea that ijma or consensus – um, has been an ambiguous term through Muslim tradition. That is to say that even the scholars couldn't agree on a universal definition of ijma, mm-hmm. of consensus. One, would you agree with I my mean, assessment of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that, you know, look, if you really want to say the things that are, uh, there's ijma on, and this is what Imam Shafi says, and this is what Ahmed ibn Hanbal says, in effect. And, you know, numerous scholars have said since then, which is that, uh, ijma is on the core issues. Ijma al furu'a, sorry, ijma al usul leisa al furu'a. Right. So That's the right. ijma is on the basic principles, core principles, not on details. Then that's right. it. and so the things that someone like Mamashafi would say there are 
it's, there is it's around is things like five daily prayers, zina is prohibited, alcohol is prohibited, right? Fasting and Ramadan is required. So th- these are things that are really not going to get debated at, by mm-hmm. anybody. Um, so, uh, and and that's why, by the way, that the the things that you can be leave, you know, that, that if you don't believe them will cause cause you to leave Islam, are very few in number because there's very very few things that scholars can point to and say yes, everybody agrees that this is part of the religion. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why. You know, a lot of, you know, ijma is historically a tool that Muslim scholars will use to beat other people over the head. With, you know? How can you right. say this? Uh, this Precisely. Is, you know, there's a jama on this. I mean, That's 90%, right. I mean, there's one scholar in the early 10 hundreds named Abu Ishaq al Faraini from Shafi, scholar from northeast, northern Iran. He says, mm-hmm. you know, that the, the number of things he would have claimed a jama on is something like 10,000 different points. I mean, he's just, this is absolute nonsense. Um, but, so, you know, I tend to, you know, on my, like, have, uh, you know, ijma filter. So, you know, if someone starts saying ijma about something, if it's not actually something where there's consensus, then I just, I, I kind of tune out at that point. That's right. Uh, yeah, and I think typically, whether it's that particular example you gave or really throughout Muslim history, you know, what have been sort of, you know, termed sort of uh, or, or, or compiled into, uh, say, a, a, a work or like Kitab al versus Kitab al ikhtilaf for example, right, mm-hmm. which is far more voluminous than, you know, Kitab al like stuff that's been yeah, in, exactly. or, or is con- in consensus. So um, anyway, I, I want to pivot um, a little bit. Thank you so much for. I, I think it's just been an illuminating conversation. Um, and again, I, I, I uh, you know urge the listeners to check out Jack's books and 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 you know check out um, you know Dr. Brown's writings. And I think that there's just a lot uh, of, of of the conversations that we've been having on the podcast will be further elucidated there. Um, I want, you know, if I could, um, uh, to kind of maybe bring it to bring our conversation and to conclude our conversation by talking about something that is sort of has now become kind of a hot button issue, but nonetheless is something that I know that you um, have personally, you know, uh, have, have, have sort of dealt with and have talked about and discussed. Uh, and that's sort of the Muslim uh, view and approach towards the um, this, this sort of BDS movement and and where the sort of MLI initiative and program kind of fits into that. Um, and I, I'd love to kind of have you talk about it, you know, because I know that's something that you are sort of passionate mm-hmm. about. Uh, and it would be really, I think, enlightening for our listeners. Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I think that, and it's a big deal for me because and feel free to flesh uh, out. I mean, I yeah. was free so to be So basically, basically for anybody who's right. listening and uh, doesn't know about this, there's so this thing called the Muslim Leadership Initiative, which was started by this chaplain at uh, Duke named Abdullah Antepli, who is a senior member of the Gulen movement in America, if anyone's interested in that. Um, I mean, I just think that that's, that's actually not, that's not irrelevant, considering that that movement right. has historically been very, very uh, interested in building strong relationship with Israeli government. Um, the uh, and the, it was between him and then this organization in, in institution in Israel called the Shalom Hartman Institute, which is actually a very conservative institute in Israel, which is you know very pro army. And during the Gaza War a couple of years ago, you know issued lots of statements in support of the Israeli army. Um, uh, and basically, the idea was you take young Muslim leader, young Muslims, prominent young Muslims, and you take them to. Israel to learn about Zionism and learn about Judaism and, and stuff like that. Now, actually, as Sena Saeed, uh, who at the time was an independent journalist, but wrote this article for the Islamic Monthly, as she revealed in an incredibly important article, which maybe you can, uh, I don't know, put a link to or something sure. in this. Um, uh, I think it was called Faith Washing or something. Yeah, and She was. basically, she showed that the Shalom Hartman Institute had actually created this initiative or had engaged in this initiative for the purposes of undermining the BDS movement, the boycott, divest, sanction movement. Now, if anyone doesn't know what this is, this is an international movement that was spearheaded by Palestinian civil society and which has been received almost unanimous endorsement by Palestinian civil society that uh, to 
for people to engage in international boycott of Israeli institutions uh, and uh, goods and services and to divest from uh, investment in Israeli companies and institutions. So uh, this and this move's actually been very successful. If anyone's been following this, I, I countered it at least last year. Maybe it's now there's been more, but as of last year, there were in just in the last couple of years, there were seven standalone articles in The Economist about BDS. I mean, this is really, yeah. this is something that's really, and you can see how states like New York State, New York City, yeah. um, uh, other uh, municipalities and, and areas in the United States have actually uh, uh, passed laws or regulations trying to ban BDS. Uh, France actually criminalized, last year criminalized BDS. So in France, Je suis Charlie, freedom of expression, etc. If you actually wear a T-shirt saying "Boycott Israel," that's a crime. It's actually a crime in France. Mm -hmm. and that was upheld by the French courts as of October yeah. 2015. That's correct. Now, so this is a very effective movement, and you can tell how effective it is because of the amount of feathers it ruffles and the amount of uh, uh, kind of reactions it provokes. And it's been more effective than anything else, in my opinion, in kind of uh, putting pressure on Israeli government policies. Now, um, so this movement, MLI, was designed, was designed to undermine this movement. So it was to take young Muslims, American Muslims, and basically uh, n make them in undermine this movement. And, and not only that, but become exemplars of this. Think about this. This is called Muslim Leadership Initiative. It's an initiative to create Muslim leaders. Now... Forget about the fact that it's absolutely ridiculous that any community will have its leadership selected by the out by outside actors who, let's just say, probably don't have the best interests of the Muslim community in mind. Okay? Forget about the fact that that's just on its face a r r ridiculous concept that no one should accept. This Correct. is actually this is actually if you care about Palestinian issue, okay, which all these people who went on MLI say they do, okay, um, if you if you actually want to do what Palestinians want you to do to help them. They've said, we want you to support BDS. And when these MLI people went to uh, Israel, they met Palestinian leaders and they all said, please don't do this. Please support BDS. So these people who went on MLI ignored this uh, yeah. because they were getting a nice gravy train ride uh, into um, the good graces of American uh, public, the American public square. Now, uh, why is why is MLI so bad? One, it is designed to undermine BDS. Okay. Two, it actually undermines BDS. Three, it's Muslims who are undermining BDS. Now, mind you, there's all these non-Muslims, like the Presbyterian Church like a, a lot of Unitarian churches, like uh, elements of the Quaker church, like um, a Jewish Voices for Peace, like right. uh, scientists like Stephen Hawking, uh, about, two, about a year and a half ago, around 200, 300, I can't remember the exact number of British academics published an article or an advertisement in, uh, yeah. I think it was in the, the Times or the Independent saying, this is, we argue for a boycott of Israel. I mean, right. there's all these non-Muslims, even even as a, in I have to say, as, as, as a Pink Floyd fan, Roger Waters. Exactly, Roger Waters. Okay, 2015, one of yeah. the most read articles in the yeah. Washington Post was an article by two Jewish professors, one from Harvard, one from MIT. And the, the, article, the, title, the title of the article was, I think, um, we are two Jews and lifelong Zionists and we're calling for the boycott of Israel. So Eve, that was one of the most read articles in the Washington Post that year. 2015. So you can, you're, again, you can give uh, that link to the listeners or whatever. So all these people, Jews, Christians, atheists, Buddhists, rock stars, non-rock stars, scientists, they're all coming out saying we support BDS. Who's the ones who are going against BDS and undermining it now? It's young Muslims. Think about that disgrace. Now, Black Lives Matter leadership has come out supporting BDS. Mm -hmm. And who's, mm -hmm. who's against it? Who's undermining it? It's young Muslims. And not only, by the way, young Muslims, the young Muslims who are very coincidentally now very prominent young Muslims. Isn't that interesting? You know, I find that to be fascinating. Okay. And I'll, and I'll also go to say is I'm not going to name any names, but I'm not sure all these people, uh, let's just say, have the normal amount of skill required to occupy the certain, the, the, the place they do.
the space um, that they do, right? Right. They right. now. I mean, that's just my opinion. I I can't yeah. prove that. That's that's. I mean, somebody likes somebody's writing. Other person doesn't like their writing. You know, God knows a lot of people don't think that uh, John Tesh should have been as famous as he was. <laughs> remember John Tesh? Of course. <laughs> okay, I don't start off the entertainment tonight, correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then he had that weird like piano career or something. <laughs> yes, anyway. he did. Okay, and now so, he's on, I think, a late night radio. Uh, yeah, talk go. Show. You can you can put this on as a link too for your listeners. But my point Wait. is that is it who you know where are Muslims going to be on this issue? You no, know, the world is moving. The world yeah. is the, the 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 situation is changing on Israel Palestine issue. You know, the world, the, the Israeli apartheid policies are becoming more and more obvious to more and more people. And are Muslims going to be on the right side of that, which they always were, or are they going to be on the wrong side? Right. right. Um, so that, that's that's the the third, uh, I think either the second or the third major problem. The fourth major problem is that again, there has been since basically since nine eleven. An attempt by the main, main, and I'll say, power elite establishments of American of American life in the government and civil society. There has been an attempt to create an established good Islam. And there's a great article by a professor in Stanford. I think it's 2011 issue of Stanford Law Review on creating an establishment Islam. Establishing mm. Islam as a religion. I think I have to get the the title for you. But basically, this art, this author just goes through. It's now even a you know, it's probably four or five years old now. The article. But he basically goes through and he shows how there's all these this effort by American, uh, let's say, philanthropic organizations, American government, to create um, moderate Islam. Yeah, you know, this Islam sort of that's good basically Muslim narrative. Yeah, deep, yeah. depoliticized. Yeah. Uh, politically neutered Muslims. Quietist, who pacifist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who basically just now fall just squarely within the center part of the Democratic Party. Absolutely. Now, think about this. Why is as my as as an American, it's my right to have political views. If I don't like American foreign policy, I have every right as an American to say I don't like this policy. If I think that there's a policy that's better for America domestically, I can go and I can advocate for that policy. Okay. The only people who are not allowed to do this are Muslims. They are the only yeah. people who are not allowed to have political opinions. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, unless they want to get up and say, you know, my son died in Iraq and I, I believe in the Constitution. I'm not cr trying to criticize the Khan family, but I think it's really telling that the it only is. political statement Muslims can make is that they are willing to go and fight in, 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 in the army and die in unjust wars. Correct. I mean, that's pretty pathetic, right? That just sort of bl blind mm -hmm. uh, militarism is the only political act we can engage in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the by the way, where are Muslims now actually not politically neutered anymore? It's Muslims who engage in things like Black Lives Matter. Muslims yeah. who people like Omar Suleiman or people like Linda Sarsour who are out there as now you might want to say kind of left, left progressive activists. Now, all those organizations also support BDS. They don't. They don't go on faith washing trips to Israel. So my point is that, you know, when I my my main 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 concern about MLA is not the Palestinian issue. It's not, um, you know, what's the most effective way to change Israeli policy. That's important to me. But for me as an American Muslim, the absolute most important thing is that young Muslims ha cannot think. I don't want them to think that the path forward, the path to respectability, the path to influence, is through these establishment routes that have been laid out for them, that have been laid out for them. Yeah, yeah. That's not, you know, you don't, you're not going to, you should not take the, the path of the people who are offering you money, offering you ease, uh, and, all, and all they're asking of you is to compromise on political positions. That's not something that Americans are required to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I myself couldn't think of the name or I, I don't know which article you were referencing uh, from the Stanford professor. But I know like this is something that Dr. Jackson, for example, Dr. Sherman Jackson, you know, he calls the domestication of religion in America. Right. And and and, and one of the things that I think often people often people fail to see or fail to realize is that you know, as we recognize that one of the cardinal principles outlined for us in the Constitution is the separation of state of church and state, uh, a lot of times that conversation tends to revolve around the fact that, okay, we don't want sort of the official establishment of a, a, a like, we don't want an establishment of an official religion by the state. 
Um, but it's not just so much the conversation usually tends to revolve around protecting the state from religion. But I think that w also a salient feature of that is to protect religion, the integrity of religious expression from state interference. And I think precisely the kind of what you're talking about in terms of like the establishment of the good Muslim narrative, uh, these various think tanks and government agencies and so on that are presenting this narrative as what is moderate Islam or what is, you know, what is what, what is what is the good Muslim um, is precisely the kind of dangers that 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 the sort of founders were warning against in terms of this sort of. Of, the, uh, of that uh, of the uh, inter intertwined relationship between church and state. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I, I mean, I, I want to be very clear. Like, you know, I have. I think if young Muslims want to go learn about Judaism, that's great. If they want to learn about Zionism, that's great. Okay. If they want to engage in dialogue with Jews and Zionists and whatever, that's great. You can do that anywhere. You can do that in New York. You can do that in Washington D.C. You can do that in Zurich, in Switzerland. You can do it in right. Tahiti, for all I care. But <laughs> You know, the fact that this was being held, in, and in fact, the organizers insisted it was held mm -hmm. in Israel. I heard of this from one of the organizers themselves. It was insisted that it was held in Israel. Should r reveal what the actual purpose is. Right. The purpose is to fit, force people to, to break the boycott uh, and go in there. Yeah. And, you know, you, Muslims need to, they need to, I'm, I'm really sometimes astounded by the naivete of, of Muslim leaders of around my age. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys who are always complaining about uncles and aunties. I sometimes feel that uncles and aunties are much more profoundly, you know, have, th they're able to think in like three and four dimensions. A lot of these young people my age, I'm, I'm just like, are you actually this naive? Or are you just, are you just pr pr protecting, perpetuating this naivete because it allows you to make the kind of choices you make? I mean, yeah. when people say, when people say, well, you know, um, like this namaz near my house just issued a couple weeks ago this this poor guy got arrested by the FBI for you know material support of terrorism and you know first of all he just was arrested so yeah he's just presumed innocent <laughs> presumed innocent second right. of all he probably didn't do anything anyway third of all, yeah yeah third of all we all only know the track work on these issues they issued a thing you know thanking the FBI for arresting him i was like what what in god's name like, do I, do you issue things for the FBI thanking them for arresting, you know, a drug dealer the other day? You're issuing, who does this? Who actually issues, you know, press releases thanking someone for going into their community yeah. and probably arresting, probably provoking a crime? And by the way, why didn't that mosque issue something saying, we support this person's family? We're there for them to help them in this tough time. Right. So, and, you know, people don't even bat eyelids at this anymore. This is how Muslims right. have been. They've really been beaten into this. They've they been have. beaten into right. uh, positions of subordination where they don't even assert their rights as Americans. As Americans, you don't have to write thank you notes <laughs> to the FBI for arresting somebody. That's right. That's this their is, job. This is just subordination apologetics writ large. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, well, um... No, no, I, I really appreciate your comments, Jack, uh, I, I, especially on this issue of MLI. Um, and, and, and for full disclosure, you know, I know we talked off air about this. For our listeners, you know, we, we've had previous guests on the show. We don't need to go into names. You can go back and listen to those episodes who have either themselves been a part of certain MLI cohorts or, uh, or regardless, have written or spoken in favor of them. Um, and so I, I felt it was our duty to, at the same time, uh, to feature someone who who offers a passionate alternative voice to that narrative. Um, and I, so I, I really want to thank you for that, um, you know, and thank you for putting it on the record, as it were. Um, My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you for the entire episode. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap. Um, Jack, it's been really a pleasure. Uh, where can people find you online, uh, perhaps engage you uh, if they're interested in doing so? Um, well, uh, I guess I have a Facebook page. Okay. And now I'm on Twitter, although I have an agreement with my wife, which is that she has to approve everything I want to tweet because the reason I didn't go on Twitter until now is because I have a my mouth is really huge. I mean, I really <laughs> not, I, and I have to I'm say, not, 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 we'd be remiss not, not to for mention, me. 
we'd be remiss not to mention your 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 wife Layla uh, Layla Larian who herself yeah she's a, a yeah she's a rock she's star a, we need to have her on the show so yeah that's, she's a Peabody uh, yes. award winning journalist and RFK award winning RFK journalism award winning journalist and two time Emmy nominee um I didn't yeah know she's what, the I don't know what the Emmy she hasn't won it yet she hasn't won it no, yet no, but she's a, yeah so um no. But, so anyway, yeah. So then, and then also, um, on Twitter, but it's uh, it's it's subject to um, uh, approval from. Uh, yeah, and then the, also yeah. you can email me at my just Google Jonathan Brown Georgetown or something like that. You'll find my email address. Or uh, yeah, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and in terms of uh, sort of forthcoming books, articles, uh, anything that you want to maybe uh, kind of drop a hint for the audience. Well, uh, sure. I'm writing. A, I'm almost done with a book on. Uh, it's called. Um, uh, what is it called? Islamic justice and Islamic law, Madalam courts, the ulama, and legal reform. And it's uh, me and uh, actually another author, a guy named Guy Burak. Uh, oh. We co-authored this book, and it looks at the. Really, it's a history of looking at this issue of what happens when. Uh, legal systems and just and notions of justice are not in sync or what happens when you have a legal system or a legal process that gives you a, a result that you don't consider to be just mm. uh, so this is actually something muslims think about a lot if you think about it so that yeah. book will hopefully we're almost done with it hopefully it'll come out and uh then what else i'm doing this uh translation of the six books which i'm the head of a project to do that uh, with uh, six books of hadith along with commentary, and that'll be I, online. I heard about but that. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Are you, are you working with some other people on that? Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> Several. God, is, God, is, is, God, is, is, yes. Joe? is Is Joe? Joe Bradford, he's translating some of it. Another guy named Abdurrahman um, is translating. Okay. Uh, so there's a couple I mentioned of us. Joe because we had you on the show. Show about three episodes ago. Oh, he's so a I very, wonder. very learned person. He's a very learned. He is. Person. He is an old, so, an old friend from Houston of mine. Uh, someone who had the uh, privilege of knowing, uh, and just a, just a stand-up guy. So I want to make sure. Go, you know. Yeah. So that's uh, that. Him again. Yeah. That project will. I mean, I hope it'll be done. I try not to think about it, but I hope it'll be done in the near future. But it's just it's massive, and it's massive. but it will also be a great. It'll be the inshallah the most important thing I ever do. Hopefully, so I'm, I'm very happy to be inshallah, God willing, and and among many others. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's going to be a monumental work. Uh, just from what I've seen online and heard uh, Joe mention, as well as yourself. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Zeki now to close this out. Uh, people can uh, leave us a review on iTunes, wherever they download a uh, podcast. Also send emails to diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Also be sure to hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffusedcongruence. Uh, leave a star rating, leave a review, spread the word. Every little bit helps. And, you know, the, the amount of feedback we've gotten over the past several years has been tremendous, but just more than anything else word of mouth telling people you dig the show turning them onto it introduce them to an episode that you like it all really helps so so big thanks for being such a great audience and we hope you will stick with us for future episodes and we will be back very shortly with our next one this is diffuse congruence until then